now the uh, extension of the um, transmission grids um, has taken off. But as you can see in, in, on this graphic, it is, a bit, it is a little difficult to see. We have to curtail a lot of uh, the energy that is produced um, by renewables. And that's, of course, somewhat a shame. And it's also expensive because uh, you then have to use other electricity um, to, uh, uh, to uh, provide for the uh, demand. And um, if you just discard uh, the electricity that you cannot transport from your know, renewables, that is expensive. And it, is, um, it has, as you can see, uh, increased significantly uh, since uh, 2013. Now, um, but the other thing. Which and, color is it the problem? The light blue or? And no, that is, um, uh, this is all curtailment, but uh, the colors are the different uh, energy sources. Uh, so um, uh, and the blue is all wind, and um, then uh, the gray is uh, solar and biomass. Then the different color of the blue is a different <laughs> region, but different, uh, different wind sources onshore, offshore, onshore. and um, combination of both. Exactly. Uh, so. This is the one challenge that we have in the grids, the transmission. But we also have a challenge in our distribution grids. You know, the diff distribution grid is the low voltage grid that was built to provide then the customer, industrial customers and, um, uh, and customers with uh, electricity. That is what it was built for. But now we are all also using it to collect electricity from decentral um, uh, energy sources like PV, like uh, like wind. And it was not built for that purpose. So it's distribution grid and now becomes a collecting grid. And um, in some places, like for example here in, in eastern Germany, uh, the, um, the electricity that, is, uh, that um, is collected by the grid, the amount is much greater than the one that is consumed because there are not so many people living here. Uh, and at the same time, there are large areas that are available, for example, for PV um, parks or something like that. And, um, and uh, the intake can be um, more than 100 times uh, higher than, uh, uh, than um, the supply for, for, for the customers. And that is why uh, the, the uh, distribution grids need to be uh, heavily upgraded. And this is also something uh, that um, especially our a company deals with uh, uh, at the moment as a um, distribution grid operator uh, to make sure that um, the system stays uh, re reliable and uh, resilient. Now, talking about markets, um, how is this all orchestrated? You saw that we have a large diversity of um, electricity sources. We have a complicated grid. We um, uh, we have a supply and demand in different places and so on. And of course, we need a smart markets to, to orchestrate all of this system. Um, we are in a liberalized system. Um, since uh, 1998, we liberalized the system uh, um, on two levels. So the one level is generation, electricity generation, is a generator of electricity you sell, uh, sell your electricity to a wholesale market. And the other um, liberalized part is retail business. So um, if you want to um, buy electricity for your home, uh, you get a contract, but you can cho choose your provider. Your provider then has to um, buy the electricity from the wholesale market, bundle it for you, and supply you with uh, electricity to your home. Um, and we have a very fragmented retail market. You, we have um, uh, uh, um, a lot of players who do only retail um, and only um, work with uh, the wholesale market and to, to pro provide them with uh, electricity. And so you have a large choice um, and these um, players all compete with each other. So only the transmission grids and the distribution grids um, keep um, being regulated because we call it a natural a monopoly. Um, you do, obviously, you do not uh, want to build several grids and then every customer has to uh, decide which grid to use. That wouldn't make sense. So this uh, is uh, regulated. And the regulation also ensures that all customers are supplied with um, uh, 
uh, electrical grid, no matter if it is um, uh, super economic to do it uh, or, or not. So, but how does the wholesale market work? I don't know if you know this picture. This is um, schematic uh, merit order. That, that means um, you can see here uh, the costs of uh, the different energy uh, or electricity sources. And um, these electricity sources are ordered by cost. And it is, um, it is uh, the marginal costs that you see here. So that means how much does it cost to produce an, an additional unit of electricity? That uh, is then, of course, correlated uh, to the prices of the fuel. So the most costly fuel would then um, have the highest marginal costs. And of course, uh, hydro, uh, wind, and solar do not need fuels, and then they are from here. And if you uh, want to meet a certain demand, uh, then you can see here, for example, this demand. Um, then we will yield this price, which is based on the marginal cost uh, of the price setting unit, which is in this case a gas fired power plant. And if the uh, demand drops uh, and um, the marginal uh, uh, cost and then it goes to a coal fired power plant in this case, then the price, market price, will uh, drop as well. It is very important to understand that Germany has only one price zone. So that means all over the country, the wholesale electricity price is the same. The market, <laughs> somebody is shaking his head. Uh, because in California it's completely different. You have uh, um, uh, it's the opposite side. Um, in Germany, the market does not take into account the structure of the electricity grid. It is as though uh, the, uh, the the connection between um, the different places would be perfect, like imagining a huge copper plate or something like that. And um, after after the price is set, then the, um, the grid operators have to take into account uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the structure of the grid afterwards, which we call redispatch. So that means if, if, the, uh, if there is uh, some supply in the north and some demand in the south, and um, it is not possible to match them with the normal market price, then the grid operator has to say, OK, please. Um, uh, reduce the electricity and uh, electricity production in the north and, and um, increase it in the south by this and that power plant. And um, we will remunerate you for, for, for doing so. That is how, how it's done at the moment. And of course, there are discussions to change it. It worked well in the past, but now this redispatch pro process has increased significantly because the electricity generation is way far away from uh, the um, centers of um, consumption. Yes, what, please. What are the main uh, forces preventing <coughs> Germany from moving to LMP market? From? Oh. LMP, so like a more granular market. What, why why, why ah, is it taking so That's a, basically a political discussion. So in Germany, um, you want uh, what you want, which is <coughs> probably a bit difficult to understand, uh, you want um, to have a kind of a uniformity of the standards of living throughout the country. So although that might be a bit artificial, uh, it is important for us to say, OK, we do not uh, um, uh, say we do not give an advantage to northern Germany just because there, there are renewable energy sources. We want, would like to have it in a socialized way so that everybody sees the same. Uh, the redispatch process, for example, then is a grid cost that will also be distributed over. Uh, over the cu and customers of the grid zone. And um, another um, thing is that um, the industry is basically in the south. If you um, introduce different price zones, then the industry in the south would have higher electricity prices. And you don't want that. You want also to protect your, uh, your industry from higher electricity prices. Um. So if it doesn't vary by location, does it vary by time of day? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, it works like this: and the availability of um, okay. uh, the um, uh, of and the electricity sources varies 
Um, for example, if you have a lot of PV, then you will see a shift of the merit order. And of course, if the demand stays the same, you see that the price will drop. Okay, so that is that the primary mechanism Germany uses to like shift demand over different courses of the day? Let's say there's like a high, you know, high supply to low demand. So you like PV is highest in the middle of the day, so the demand is often lowest. So you have to shift um, that by charging lower prices. Or well, uh, yes and no, and more no like yes, okay. <laughs> because um, this is not the price that uh, that the end customer see. That's the wholesale price. And only, let's say, like huge operators, uh, industrial operators would, would take uh, this into account. Or, uh, for example, um, uh, factories that, would, that run their own power plants um, or steel manufacturers or people like that, they can react uh, to a high prices, but not, let's say, the customers uh, that uh, use electricity just like that, because we do not yet have this connection between the retail prices and the wholesale market prices. There is no direct mechanism. But it, um, for industrial customers, yes, they can uh, change um, their uh, production. And here you can, for example, see if you imagine this to be a huge uh, industrial complex, they could say, OK, how do I match my uh, demand? And, um, the, and the products that, that, uh, that are available on, on the wholesale market. And um, the products are um, actually uh, mostly, they are traded as uh, futures, futures and forwards uh, and on different timescales. So you have different kinds of products. You can uh, have long-term contracts um, to, uh, to ensure, uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, a min minimum of supply, then you have both base load and peak load products. Uh, you have individual hours that uh, as contracts, and these are trade. And e e now you have um, also 15 minute contracts, and these are traded uh, on um, in advance. So the closer you get, the shorter uh, time scales get. And before the crisis, you could trade, let's say, year contracts for. Uh, the uh, third year in advance. So you could oh. now uh, have a contract uh, for, um, for, an, an, uh, for in three years to be provided with electricity uh, on a certain level throughout the, the year uh, 20, um, 2025, for example. Now uh, the markets have become more difficult, more focused on the short term, because the risk for long-term trade is too, too high. Yeah. So, and, um, also, it's, it's so high that um, actually some companies, even large companies, cannot afford uh, um, um, uh, and, and the, uh, the risk deposit anymore. So okay. <laughs> you will get a margin call if you, if, you, uh, if you try to do that. And they don't, don't, just don't have the money to trade on, on that uh, 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 time in advance anymore. Pro closer you get. Um, and the smaller the products get, and then you also have intraday trading, where it really then um, uh, uh, is um, uh, contract by contract. And but this clear mechanism, as beautiful as it is just here, is mostly a day ahead mechanism. So, hope this is clear and significant. So just one word about carbon pricing, because it's, it also affects uh, the um, uh, the uh, the uh, electricity price. So we are, have a carbon pricing mechanism in Europe. When you have a facility like um, a coal-fired power plant, you have to purchase certificates for every um, ton of CO2 that you emit. And you can also sell these certificates again. So that means if you can buy them and sell them, that there's a price for them. You can, could also trade them. And uh, there's price development uh, and um, there's a cap of certificates. So uh, there's a certain amount of certificates that will be issued and not more. That means in the electricity sector, you can automatically steer uh, the um, CO2 level that is, or the, the amount of CO2 that is emitted uh, in, in Europe. And because, simply because the number of certificates is limited. And um, this cap of CO2 certificates also ensures then a certain kind of scarcity and then a certain price. So that didn't work for some time where uh, the prices were very low. There were too many certificates in the market. Um, and uh, 
it, it, it went to like five euros per ton, which is not so much if you have a feeling for that, and um, has now ramped up to uh, 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 nine, 90 euros per ton, and now I think it's about 60. So, but how, how does this affect the merit oven? If you, for example, take a look at lignite, lignite is much, is much more CO2 intensive than, for example, natural gas. So per uh, kilowatt hour that you produce with lignite, you would um, produce much more CO2 than you would produce with natural gas. That also means that you need more uh, CO2 certificates for your lignite fire power plant. And that would increase the marginal cost of the plant. So, and in the end, um, if the, uh, uh, if the um, CO2 price is uh, sufficient, then um, there will be a few switch. So that and, and they, and the merit order changes and you have a switch between, um, between for example, gas and uh, hard coal. So uh, that um, the, the marginal cost, overall marginal cost for hard coal might be even higher uh, than for gas. And then if a certain demand is met, uh, then hopefully uh, a little less um, coal is consumed uh, than a gas. So that's the basic mechanism, how the um, CO2 pricing will affect um, also the production um, of uh, electricity and then reduce uh, the overall CO2 emission. Now, there is something that we, um, what we, that we need uh, to balance um, uh, supply and demand. The um, pricing mechanism that I just showed you is a little cost. So uh, it cannot um, make up for, let's say, um, the, uh, the changes in demand and um, electricity supply on um, a level of seconds, you know? If I go, um, um, uh, if I go to a switch and switch off the light, then immediately, basically, uh, some power plant needs to produce more electricity, and that cannot uh, cannot be done um, uh, by a wholesale market. And that's why we have uh, something that we call balancing power. I don't know if the same term is used here. Um, it sometimes has, has uh, uh, or it's sometimes called reserve power or something like that. But you need it everywhere. Um, and I don't want to go into details. Reserve or balancing power markets are also a very difficult thing uh, to comprehend and uh, would take a lot of time to explain everything. But you can imagine, imagine that it, if it is made to balance out these short-term differences between supply and demand, you would expect the demand for, uh, for balancing power to increase if you introduce more renewable uh, energy sources because they are volatile and they will um, unbalance the system to some degree yeah, on, 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 on a short temporary notice. So, but as you can see here, in the demand for balancing power, it has actually decreased in recent years in Germany. And why, how was that achieved? There were three things that uh, come into play there. The first was uh, a zonal integration. Um, where we worked um, between the different uh, balancing um, uh, zones, uh, also with, with, together with our neighboring countries. The second one was improved weather forecast. So if you, um, if you know exactly how much your renewable electricity will produce tomorrow or in the next hour or so, then also you can um, factor that in, into the wholesale market and uh, then you will need less balancing power. And, uh, the, and the third one is increased activity on the intraday market. So the traders were very focused on short-term trading and uh, got better and better in exchanging, in exchanging electricity on short notice. And this also helped um, balancing out the system. But this, of course, cannot go on forever. This is already very optimized. But at that time, um, we, uh, we seem to be winning the race, at least for balancing power. Now, switching to uh, the retail market. Switching to the retail market. So that's the side of the customer. That's a different thing. Um, because as, a, uh, as, a, as an electricity customer, you obviously do not want to buy, let's say, hourly contracts or 15-minute contracts or so. You just, you just want to go and 
to uh, the uh, switch on the wall and switch it on and uh, you have a package so that you do not have to care for um, for uh, the uh, procurement of the uh, electricity. And, and that's why the electric customer electricity <coughs> prices look completely different. Mm -hmm. Here you can see that in, in, in recent years, mm, the electricity price for the end customer in Germany was about uh, 30 cents per kilowatt hour, which is pretty much in the international, uh, if you compare it to international price. And um, here you have all kinds of components uh, in there uh, with uh, nice words like paragraph 19, Strom, Netz, and Geld, Verordnungsumlage. For everyone who learns German among you, is, that is a very interesting word. And I don't want to explain in detail what it is. It has something to do with um, protecting energy and, and intensive industry. But um, the point is, that uh, you mostly have, for example, uh, subsidies for renewables in the green bars. Then you have um, uh, um, you have uh, grid levy that takes into account the costs of the grid per kilowatt hour. And um, then the bar, the, and the, uh, the lowest bar, the dark blue one, that is the one that is governed by the wholesale market. So you see in recent years, the part that was actually done in a, a competitive way, so that actually was governed by markets. That was pretty small here. And the rest of it was just more or less regulated. Yeah, you also see taxes here. So uh, we have uh, a value added tax also on uh, electricity. And uh, that means also that you pay a tax for all the Levi's. You even pay a tax for another tax, the electricity tax. That is a bit absurd, and um, also something politicians are working uh, on right now to, to reduce that uh, tax load because the electricity prices are uh, so high at the moment. And they also abolished um, the green bar, uh, the, um, in, in, in the subsidies for um, renewable energy, which is now which now comes from uh, taxes from uh, from the state. Um, so, but this has heavily increased since uh, since the crisis. If you now um, have a, want to have a new contract in Germany for electricity, it, it costs around seventy cents. Seventy cents. So that's more than doubled because this bar has increased so significantly uh, that it shifted all of the prices uh, uh, upwards. And um, that leads me over to the current crisis. This is the price development in, uh, in Germany. And as you can see, prices have really spiked recently. And uh, if you take a look at electricity, it was always around um, uh, uh, 50 um, uh, euros per megawatt hour in, 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 in the last years, and has now come up to something like 400 um, in some, uh, on in some occasions, even to a thousand uh, euros per megawatt hour. So it's roughly t has, uh, increased, increased by a factor of 10. Um, and the reason, of course, is um, the main reason is the high gas prices with um, lacking supply from, uh, uh, from, uh, from Russia. Um, we see a scarcity on the gas market, which has caused uh, the um, prices uh, also to spike, also about to. Uh, by, by a factor of 10, but also being very spiky and volatile. Um, and that also then in turn affects the electricity price. But that was not the only problem that we had on the electricity markets. We had outages of nuclear power in, in, in France, which then also affects the German electricity market. Um, we had problems with coal supply. We have had problems with, with um, mm, uh, hot river water that you cannot then use for cooling and so on and so on. And all um, uh, came up together and created this, uh, uh, this um, scarcity on the electricity market. Now, the problem is that uh, this crisis hits, uh, hits us at a very bad time. As I said before, we had problems where we had problems in the past with investments into renewables into grid expansion and so on. 
that means that we now have to uh, increase our uh, investment significantly. We have to speed it up. So our government says roughly by a factor of uh, three in everything. We have to build it uh, three times faster than before. And that's, I guess that's roughly uh, uh, right. So it works with uh, the studies that I know th that um, you have to increase um, the, the speed with which you uh, expand renewables, for example, by a factor of three. And you see here in, in that graphic, uh, the huge offtake that we need in, um, in uh, the investments in, into renewables to achieve our, uh, uh, our CO2 reduction targets, and which, for example, is 65% um, of um, greenhouse gas reductions until 2030, and um, uh, greenhouse gas neutral neutrality until 2045. So, um, and this, of course, doesn't just happen uh, uh, like that. It, it needs to be then supported with, um, with instruments uh, from the regulator. And um, our government came up with uh, 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 yeah, a long paper, 600 pages, um, about measures how to speed up uh, decarbonization. Mm. And an important thing uh, among these measures is um, to facilitate uh, and, uh, yeah, the feasibility of uh, renewable projects. As I said before, the problem is not that the money is not there or uh, that uh, there are not enough auctions by, uh, done by, um, by the state. It's mostly that we cannot implement the projects. And to speed this up, and the regulator um, will change, let's say, the environment in which we can build uh, these projects, giving them more priority, basically, um, over the interests. And um, uh, also, uh, the volumes that and that will be uh, yeah um, will come up and tenders will obviously also be increased and uh, there will be um, land assigned uh, to to these projects uh, so that they can um, actually be implemented. Um, yes, but how does where does this all go? So. Until 2030, it's pretty clear what we have to do, although it will be very difficult to achieve. Um, this, is, this is an overview about uh, over things that we have to do until 20, uh, uh, 2030 and then um, uh, 2045. And for 2030, it's mostly about uh, introducing electric vehicles, introducing heat pumps to buildings to electrify heat supply uh, and to expand um, renewable generation very fast. At the same time, we have to keep up with the grid. So um, at E.ON, we will probably have in the end twice as much uh, distribution grids uh, uh, as before. I mean, not in area, but in, uh, in investments. Uh, and um, so um, also this needs to be ramped up very fast. It needs, all needs to be synchronized well. All, uh, the different parts of the energy uh, system will not work together um, anymore. Uh, and uh, that is uh, mostly the, uh, the challenge with that. And um, also, you need uh, until 2030 additional backup capacity. And this uh, particular um, study said about 40 gigawatts of, uh, of gas-fired power plants, which is just a huge amount. It's a huge amount. So um, it, uh, uh, this amount of uh, gas-fired power plants are... Uh, or fossil generation has never been built before in that time. And you, as you can imagine, few people are now willing to invest into a, a gas-fired power plants with uh, the gas market being so tense at the moment. So that is a, 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 a huge um, challenge. And then the question remains what we do afterwards to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, that, is, that is difficult to say. So for 2030, I mean, it's more or less clear what we have to do. It's just the question how we do it. But after that, uh, it's also the question what we do. How do you achieve carbon neutrality if you have already a high degree of renewables in your system? Um, at some point, building more and more re renewables um, becomes much more expensive because um, you have to carry the integration costs of renewables. You have to build 
um, a flexible demand, you have to build new storage, you have to um, extensively build uh, new grids and so on. So um, if you, if you uh, exceed about 80% of renewables, then it becomes very difficult in the energy system. And the question is whether to go, for example, more uh, to uh, import of renewable er energy carriers or the domestic production. Will you go into biomass or will you go more into hydrogen? Um, will you um, be very energy uh, efficient? Or will you, um, again, use more imports? It's not 100% uh, clear um, what uh, direction we will be going into. And that's why I believe it is uh, very important to start now exploring the, uh, the technologies that uh, we will need and to um, go to 100% renewable or at least um, <clears throat> carbon neutrality. Um, these can, can be all kinds of options, could also be negative emissions that we introduce uh, into the system. So, but uh, that re leaves a lot of room for research and uh, it is not so clear how this will be the, uh, exactly done um, then in the future. So, thank you very much. That, uh, that was it, I hope it was. It's not, it's not so easy to do, describe the whole energy system in like 50 minutes. Um, <laughs> and if you are confused to some point, then that's just normal. Um, but please, um, if you have any question, then, questions, then go ahead. Hi, thanks for your talk. I wrote down a few questions. Um, one was, you mentioned that they only have one price for the whole grid. Like, do people take advantage of that? Like, is there a way to like do some kind of like funny market behavior or something? Uh, not at the moment. So uh, what you, mm, because it is basically not uh, rewarded if you, uh, if you do something like that, if you, for example, uh, restrict um, or uh, uh, reduce your energy production, then basically you have to pay it yourself because, <laughs> because most of the electricity is marketed in, in advance. And if you just reduce that, then you have to buy the electricity from the market and sell it again, and you, then you lose yourself. So that is not possible at the moment, or let's say it would be difficult at the moment. But once you introduce mechanisms that would reward um, a behavior that is beneficial for the grid, then that would be a danger that needs to be regulated. For example, somebody could reduce, um, or let's say could, um, uh, could produce a uh, shortage in the grid and then uh, at the same time offer the solution for that with flexibility. And that is something that we call in-deck gaming, um, which needs to be avoided if we introduce market, new market me mechanisms uh, that um, would then be beneficial for the grid. Yes. Cool. I was also wondering, you, like, does Germany import a lot of electricity from other countries because the prices are so high, right? So like, maybe they could. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the electricity prices in Europe are interlinked. Right. Um, How are they? Uh, uh, it's, um, it depends very much on the country. It works like this. You have interconnectors between the different countries. And as long as these interconnectors are not fully loaded, um, the prices remain the same. Uh, but um, if you have a higher demand in one country and the interconnectors are basically full, then uh, uh, and then the price in this uh, country uh, will increase and it will remain on the same level on the other country because the interconnectors cannot uh, uh, provide more, more exchange. And that is why we see, um, let's say, in, in Northern Europe, we do not have high electricity prices because they mainly rely on hydropower. Uh, but the high electricity prices are then in, in, middle, in the middle of Europe and France and, uh, and, and, and Germany and so on. And I guess my last question um, is if we put more like renewables on the grid in Germany, or um, you mentioned that like if they like tell them to turn off because there's too much in one area, they get paid like a, a, a tax, a levy or something like afterwards because they didn't produce or something. Um, yeah, sometimes if you, if for example, um, there's too much um, renewable electricity available and the grid can't, can't transport it away you would say, uh, okay, you have to shut down uh, that plant and I will give you money as though you had produced the electricity. So if people like keep building solar and stuff in the same location, won't it like increase the price? Because it will increase that price, like that tax 
please? Again, please. So I might be misunderstanding, but like if if it's like made like a copper plate network and so everyone makes solar in like the same areas where it's sunny or like you make wind in the same areas where it's sunny. And then they tell you, please don't produce because it's like too much oversupply in one area. Yeah. And then like, every consumer has to pay this tax to yeah. to the government so that it can redistribute it. Yes. So won't that increase prices if yeah. we add more renewables? Ah, and no, if we're not just, if we're, um, only not just reduce the prices as much as they could. So you add additional capacity, but you can't use it. So that doesn't increase the prices or directly. Like increase the tax. Yeah, it would, it would increase the tax. But um, yeah, you're right. Um, if, if you would just continue uh, doing it like that, straightforward, uh, that, uh, that's true. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. Um, it would increase the tax because you would pay for electricity that is not used and distributed uh, uh, throughout uh, uh, over our customers. And that is what we had in the past. But now there is some restriction to that. And so it is um, uh, a little less rewarded uh, if you do not <laughs> reduce electricity. So the government saw, okay, that is going to be much uh, too expensive if we do it like in the past. And um, so they restricted this uh, remuneration that you get if you, if you do not produce. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But that was an expensive thing, you're right. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. This is a fairly specific uh, question, but uh, I'm kind of curious what the strategy is for in increasing like a, uh, a solar generation. So I assume there's like large plots of land with, you know, utility sized solar arrays. Is that kind of the idea? Specifically? Like if this isn't solar built on houses and commercial buildings, it's like large fields. So solar. Yeah, we have both. And so what is your question? Sorry. So specifically, my question is that just looking at the last 10 years, the uh, efficiency of solar modules has, you know, increasingly approached the theoretical limit of like 26 ish mm -hmm. percent. I'm curious that if, um, you know, what is more cost competitive? Is it making a completely new solar farm or is it to retrofit the older solar farms with newer, more efficient modules? This is this is a very specific mm, question. Okay. Sorry. Um, um, for solar, I believe um, it would be more beneficial to. Uh, in most cases, uh, it would be uh, beneficial to um, to let uh, um, the solar uh, facility run until it uh, degrades. So it will eventually degrade and lose uh, efficiency and. Uh, some of the modules won't work anymore. And then there is a point where you can say, okay, for also for, um, for uh, rooftop PV, where you could say, okay, uh, uh, your, um, your um, PV doesn't run as good as in the beginning, so you have to retrofit it to a new one. What, what, but um, what, what you say is very attractive in the case of repowering uh, um, Wind, wind onshore. Maybe I have the image there. <coughs> and um, because the first uh, wind um, power plants were very small and not so uh, efficient. And then here, you see that? That's an old one. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, it's <laughs> of it. So that is, uh, um, that is the picture from uh, the Netherlands, actually, and from uh, my former company, uh, Energy Builders, I believe. And that's very close to the coast. And these, obviously, this site is very attractive. And you don't want to waste it with these small, uh, uh, small, small um, wind power plants. If you can build such huge turbines that are much more efficient, they are much more efficient because um, they are to greater height, of course, also. Uh, and on the greater height, there is higher wind speed. And um, you have a, a huge diameter, which is able then to collect all of the energy that goes through it. And so uh, that, that is why, these, uh, why this is much, much more important for wind than for okay. solar. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. There's one more question. Yeah. Um, are we talking about like the earlier in your slides, you showed like how, thank you for also thank you for the talk, it was really interesting. Um, you showed how like from 20, 2008, um, like use of renewables really increased in Germany. And that's, um, it's like an interesting juxtaposition to the US because 
there was kind of like a bubble where people were really investing in renewables and really interested. And then when the recession hit in 2008, um, a lot of that died. And so, and you kind of mentioned how Germany has some special regulatory things that um, that kind of foster, you know, the start of renewable energies and and um, and like add a, a how, how do you say um, incentive or or help help companies or um, utilities transition to renewables. Do you know anything about why? Um, why it was more successful in Germany than the US, or is that more of like a political thing? Or what made Germany so successful as, as a In those US? days, it was just the speed and tariff that made um, and that um, made it possible to build so much renewable capacity in, in, in that time between 2009 and 2012. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it was uh, it it was really expensive, like like crazy expensive. We spent like 20 billion each year. Mm -hmm. uh, on these capacities and this, this uh, PV, PV doesn't produce so much electricity. So the, uh, the uptake of, uh, um, of capacities was great, but the share of electricity production was very low. And so that was very expensive, it was just beneficial to foster this uh, technology and, and now make it available um, for the entire world by basically on that price level. So and only very few countries can afford uh, uh, such um, uh, yeah uh, such a subsidy scheme, and also only for a limit, limited period of time. So it was not planned to do it like that. Mm -hmm. That and that is why it's not so easy to say. Oh, why don't you just do the same thing with e-mobility and do it in the U.S., mm -hmm. which which is a much greater market, and then oh. it would be super super expensive. And um, but in the end, we have. Um, all the tools, we have a lot of uh, uh, experience now with subsidy schemes, then they have changed a little bit. Mostly they are made to take away the risk from the investor. Mm -hmm. So uh, an investment into renewables is very risky. Uh, mm -hmm. You do not know about the markets. You do not know um, uh, if, if the investment will um, pay off uh, or if you can um, realize the project and so on. And these uh, subsidy schemes uh, take to a certain degree away that is for the investor um, and also ensure uh, that uh, if electricity prices drop again, which mm -hmm. they uh, eventually will do that and the investment is um, uh, profitable at all. It would take a little more time to explain how these mechanisms work, um, but all countries use them, all countries. So it's not just Germany. The, 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 the tool set is available. Basically, you just have to pick uh, the right choice for your country. Thank you. I think. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think if he will still stay a little bit longer, yeah. but the other students may have another class to catch. So, Manit, thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you.